We've all been introduced to many leading heroic faces during the glory days of the Saturday morning cartoon era. Depending on your tastes, we all preferred some heroes more than others, but the common trait among these franchises is that these individuals led the forces of good against the forces of evil. While he was treated as a leading poster boy throughout most of Sundo Animation's G.I. Joe A Real American Hero cartoon, Sergeant Conrad S. Hauser, also known as Duke, was also an important character in the comics, but served more as a member of an ensemble cast there rather than being an outright leading frontman. Now, whether you prefer the Boy Scout nature of the original cartoon or the toughest nail sergeant he was shown as being in the Marvel comic run, I'm here to talk about an early 2000s change to the character and deep dive into the dark side of Duke during the Devil's Due publishing comic series. Stay tuned. At the time of this video, I am aware that Wild Devils Do Publishing's 2001 to 2008 comic run was originally written as a follow-up to Larry Hama's epic 155-issue Marvel series. The Devils Do comics are no longer considered canon, having been superseded by the more recent IDW comic releases. For me personally though, this does little to nothing to deter how much DDP's run meant to me and I've gotten used to some epic stories either being intended as alternate continuity to begin with such as DC's Kingdom Come or other examples such as the Star Wars Thrawn book trilogy starting off as official canon only to be replaced by Disney's own storylines later on. Note that I have covered other DDP related topics such as my deep dive into the character of Snake Eyes' apprentice Kamakura, so do check out that video if you have a few spare moments. So as I mentioned a second ago, whether you prefer Duke as the vanilla babyface in his original animated form or a slightly more hard-nosed character as written by Larry Hama initially, either way he was a mostly by-the-books type of soldier. By that I mean he was a man who could follow orders, primarily kept a clean record, and fit the 1980s stereotype of a battle-hardened, idealistic field commander and role model. This, however, takes a considerable change as we head into the 21st century during the Devil's Due publishing series. In storyline at the time, G.I. Joe had been disbanded for several years, having been officially decommissioned in 1994, but reinstated in 2001 as Cobra's activities began to resurge. As expected, the reformed G.I. Joe team consists largely of the same cast, minus several individuals who died in battle during the previous Larry Hama run. Naturally, Duke is again among the cast of main characters, though this time he's seen in a black suit every bit as often as he's seen in his traditional combat gear. One seemingly subtle change early on, but becomes important, is that he's often referred to as Agent Hauser rather than the more familiar military acknowledgement of Sergeant Hauser. This is quite noteworthy because what is explained to us is that Duke largely disappeared from existence during the seven years of G.I. Joe's inactivity. We are told that Duke took an off-the-books covert assignment as a black ops agent and his experiences during this time are shrouded in a level of mystery that he isn't allowed to speak of. All in all, there seems to be a dark side added to the character. 
and edginess with how he acts and talks to others, and it becomes clear throughout the series that some level of trauma has shaped Duke into a different individual than the Joes were familiar with years earlier. The most obvious example of this occurs between issues number 28 and 31 of the DDP run that I mentioned, where Duke takes matters into his own hands to secure the capture of the famed Cobra arms dealer known as Destro. What had happened here is that Destro had orchestrated a small war between neighboring storyline South American countries known as Sierra Gordo and Sierra Muerte. Destro had tried to turn the two nations against one another by having his own mercenaries pose as invaders from Sierra Muerte crossing the border to Sierra Gordo, all while Destro had offered to pay an armed service to Sierra Gordo to protect them and route off the apparent invaders. Of course, as I've implied here, Destro was inciting a war where he controlled both sides in order to benefit himself financially. However, prior to all this, General Hawk had dispatched a small group of his own Joes to monitor the situation in Sierra Gordo, namely Ricondo, Tunnel Rat, Lowlight, Ripcord, and a new recruit named Dart. Bear in mind that this appeared to be strictly a surveillance mission from what I could tell through reading, as this is a pretty small force and not significant enough to be involved in any real open field battles. Now, while all this was going on, Duke had somehow actually been in contact with the leaders of both Sierra Gordo and Sierra Muerte, and together uncovered Destro's plan to benefit financially while pretending to help but effectively manipulate both nations. Duke travels to South America, unbeknownst to anyone on the Joe team, including General Hawk, and watches the skirmish take place. However, the small Joe group gets caught in the crossfire between the two South American nations. Lowlight and Tunnel Rat are injured, and the young Dart is left traumatized by the experience. In secret, Duke covertly orchestrates a meeting between Destro and the high-ranking officials in Sierra Muerte, and then Duke and the president of Sierra Gordo ambush the meeting, unveil that the two nations have been in contact and in cahoots all along with Duke, effectively double-crossing Destro and resulting in the capture of Destro. Now, of course, all of this sounds like careful, intelligent planning by Duke, but take a few factors into account. Duke does all this knowing that the small team of Joes in Sierra Gordo would get caught in the crossfire, risking injury or death, and tells no one of his own behind-the-scenes plan to get involved with the two nations and ensure the capture of Destro. Even General Hawk is left in the dark about Duke's plan, and it's worth noting that Duke travels to South America while on paper appearing to be on an entirely unrelated assignment somewhere else. All of this leads to a key scene during issue number 31, where Duke is at odds with other members of the Joe team, and in a post-battle debriefing, he explains his position to Hawk by saying that the battle had to look legit and that he didn't want to tip anyone off, not even the Joes whose lives he had a direct hand in endangering in the field. This of course is disappointing news to General Hawk, who naturally doesn't want his own right-hand man doing things off the book without assignment from higher up. Things get pretty intense towards the end of this debriefing, and it gets to a point where Ripcord asks if he can speak freely, and says to Duke, After the team disbanded, you spent those years in black ops doing who knows what. You're not Duke anymore. You're this man that I don't trust, and I don't really like. That bothers the hell out of a lot of people these days. It's not just me. Naturally, Duke is cold, unreceptive, and standoffish in his response, and when Flint implies to Duke that he has become no better than Cobra themselves, Duke realizes he's heard enough, grabs Flint, and dares the warrant officer to start a fight with him. Flint is about to retaliate before they are separated by General Hawk, and Duke eventually storms out of the room, once again, out of sight. As a side note, in the issues immediately following this, General Hawk receives some long-term injuries in a fight with Cobra Commander, leaving Duke to assume command of the Joe team in the interim. Now, I know there's a lot to unpack from what I just said, but I'm about to dive deeper, so get ready. I was so fascinated with the edginess and somewhat dark tone to what I had always known to be a stereotypical Captain America hero type of character. At the time I had read these stories in the early 2000s, I was so curious I had to dig around for some more backstory regarding Duke's days in Black Ops and find out a bit more about what evolved him into the character he became. All of this led me to a story arc that was written as part of the G.I. Joe Frontline series that was running concurrently with the Devil's Due main G.I. Joe title run in the same comic era. 
Issues 5 through 8 of G.I. Joe Frontline dives heavily into Duke's first Black Ops mission shortly after the 1994 disbandment of the G.I. Joe team. The opening issue of this particular story arc shows Duke summoned into General Hawk's office where Hawk mentions a mission from several years ago called Operation Cold Fire. Note here that Operation Cold Fire is classified to the level that Hawk has to ask Duke point blank if he was part of that mission, since Hawk himself doesn't really know anything about it. Duke responds with surprise, noting that the clearance level of Operation Cold Fire is so high that he's shocked to even hear about it years later. Take note of the situation. The details of the assignment were even above General Hawk's head, showing the depth of the Black Ops secrecy that was involved. Duke admits that he was indeed part of that operation, which consisted of a plan to rescue a group of scientists in a remote, cold area of Norway who had just sent out a distress signal. In flashback sequences, it is shown that these scientists were attempting to experiment with developing a cold weather type soldier in a research facility where they had mixed polar bear DNA with human DNA. The experiments go wrong and the scientists effectively infect themselves to the point that they become animalistic and bloodthirsty, inadvertently rendering the research facility completely useless. During these flashback sequences, Duke goes in with a team of covert operatives not knowing what to expect and find themselves attacked by these mutated animalistic beings, aka the scientists whose experimental work had gone wrong. Some of Duke's comrades are brutally and mercilessly killed to the point that one injured soldier even begs Duke to put a bullet through his own head to avoid being killed in vicious fashion by their predators. Of note, the scene cuts away here and it's not clear if Duke actually has to do the deed and kill his own man, but if he does, it further adds to the dark side trauma he's been somewhat plagued and subject to. By the end of the mission, Duke has to blow up all the entrances to the science facility to seal it off and set off flares for help. He is shown dragging his last surviving colleague out of the research facility and into the snow and watches as his colleague perishes in the snow from injuries. As such, Duke remains the only survivor from this Operation Cold Fire mission. Now all of this goes a long way to explain why Duke is the way he is when the team assembles and like how Ripcord mentions, his fellow Joes barely even recognize him anymore. This backstory goes a long way to also establish Duke's erratic, unpredictable, and less compassionate behavior in the present timeline. For the purposes of this video, that's about as deep as I'm willing to dive into Duke's Devil's Due publishing history here without reading issues in their entirety. But I'll point out something else noteworthy. In the DDP Order of Battle Files comics that came out, which included updated bios for each G.I. Joe character, Duke's rank is now listed as classified. This is actually something that I really like. One thing I noticed as I got older, as many of you have probably also noticed, is that he served all those years as second in command to the G.I. Joe team behind only General Hawk, all while being a master sergeant or a first sergeant. While we know that G.I. Joe is an amalgamation of operatives across multiple military branches, some would note that it is a bit peculiar seeing Duke consistently give out orders to soldiers of clearly higher ranking. Having considered all that, by adding an extended Black Ops background to Duke's history, the DDP writers have clearly and in my mind quite effectively sidestepped the aforementioned issue as he is consistently called Agent Hauser rather than Sergeant Hauser with his updated bio noting a classified secret rank like I said earlier, and it allows us to better accept him as General Hawk's second in command. I for one am a huge fan of this as we are trained in pop culture to give black suited special agents a bit of reverence and respect. Heck, he's even shown using this off the books rank and special level of clearance at times, and I personally think it suits him quite well. Now, as the one who's scripting, editing, and producing this video, I know what my intentions are here, but I hope, and by saying hope, I really hope that I haven't painted Duke in a negative light. My goals here are actually quite the opposite. Yes, as a kid in grade school watching the G.I. Joe cartoon, I needed that smiling cookie cutter type of hero that was meant to be a role model to its target audience. As a young adult, in the 2000s when this particular comic run was in print, what I needed was a significant evolution of the character to suit more contemporary times. That is what I feel Devil's Due Publishing gave us with their handling of the Duke character. All this added depth, expanded backstory, and flawed nature of the character made him way more interesting and intriguing for me. 
So when looking back over the decades of collecting, I put this particular incarnation of Duke on par and in some ways above my idealistic vision of him from my childhood. So maybe some of you have already read these stories and know about all this. Maybe some of you know this and are glad to join me as I retread some history. Perhaps some of you are hearing it for the first time and are able to share the intrigue with me as I tell this part of Duke's history. No, this part of the story is no longer considered official comic book canon, but it is very much my Duke, my special agent Conrad Hauser, and maybe in some ways he can be your vision and version of Duke or Agent Hauser in your own acceptance of the character's history. Let me know what you think in the comments section of this video. So that's it for now. Special thanks to my Patreon supporters whose names can be found in the description section of this video. Please visit patreon.com slash toy connections if you're interested in joining the Patreon yourself. And with that, if you enjoyed this deep dive into Duke's character history, please subscribe to this channel, press that like button to spread this video to more viewers, and share it with your friends. Hopefully you had as much fun as I did here, and since knowing is half the battle, you now know this part of the battle. And with that, yo Joe, and take care. I'll see you soon.